Hi students, so I have a couple of things left to tell you about chapter six topics and it branches over a little bit into um, chapter seven topics also. And not only do you need these few tidbits to uh, be successful on the quiz, but you can take reaction paper topics from this section also, or, and, not or, but and, um, you need some notes on this so that when we get to project three, which is coming up right after you finish watching this video and doing this lesson, um, you'll be able to have your open notes, open book from all of these different topics, because in, in project three, you're gonna have to figure out, I give you some scenarios about like day in the life kind of descriptions of um, certain lifestyles, and you are going to have to use your notes from these online lectures and use your open book to figure out which subsistence strategy does this scenario or does this description go with? So we've got five subsistence strategies and you're going to have to um, look at a description of a day in the life kind of scenario for each of those subsistence strategies and figure out um, where those scenarios go. So it's called the subsistence strategy unscramble and it is um, going to be, it's project three. So it's available in, um, in Blackboard for you. If not already, it'll be within the next couple of days from when you watch this video. Okay, so the last couple things that I need to mention to you from chapter six are negative reciprocity, which the very last video said that we would cover negative reciprocity the next time that we see each other. And also we need to cover leveling mechanisms like redistribution and also how you use, um, how you can use trade or um, balanced reciprocity as like a leveling mechanism so that people will have like good trade relationships with you. And then also we're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about how the band, tribe, chiefdom, and state political structures or social complexity structures um, fit into these subsistence strategies. We're going to look at like population density and political power and kinship relations that go in um, those different band, tribe, chiefdom, or state societies because um, kinship is our next big unit after we finish with our project three and after we come back from spring break. Okay. So let's talk about negative reciprocity. We know that um, reciprocity in general is a mutual give and take uh, between parties of equal social status, right? So when we're just talking about reciprocity, we should be talking about people who, in the system of social stratification that exists in the culture you're a part of, they hold the same relative position. When you put adjectives in front of it, like generalized reciprocity, balanced reciprocity that you've already seen a discussion of, or negative reciprocity, like we're going to talk about today, it changes the give and take. It changes the changes the excuse me the dynamic of the give and take of that kind of reciprocity. So today, negative reciprocity is a mutual. It's a give and take, not mutual. It's a give and take that where the the giver is willing to give something of higher value in exchange for something of lesser value, and they're happy with that exchange. So it's a it's an uneven exchange. It's not generalized, it's not balanced, it's uneven. The giver is giving something of higher value, higher social worth, um, and the, the receiver is, is giving something back, but the something back could never be equivocated. It's not, it's not equivalent with the value of what the giver gave to begin with. Okay, so I think I mentioned in the last video that you watched that um, the traditional grandparent and traditional grandchild relationship um, is a personal relationship that we can use to look at the negative reciprocity uh, concept. So that negative reciprocity concept um, in, in, as it applies to that relationship is that the grandparents are not in the immediate household. Remember, household is our economic unit word, not talking about a dwelling, but about the people who cooperate economically on a regular basis. Those are the people who are the caregiver child relationship. We're not talking about that relationship. We're talking about grandparent grandchild relationship in the traditional setting 
when the grandparents have a separate domicile and do not contribute to the daily care of the child, um, of the, of the grandchild, that's the kind of relationship we're talking about. So stereotypically grandma and grandpa, when they don't live in the same household with the children on a daily basis, they're the ones who, um, uh, you know, let you stay up too late and let you have ice cream for breakfast and don't make you follow any rules and buy you things just because you smile at them and say please and um, that kind of thing. And what did they get in return? Well, why are they doing this? You know, what's the motivation? So the motivation is for you to want to come and see them and for you to want to give them love and affection. You have no motivation to give them love or affection. Um, at all, unless that gift giving process was happening. So this is a power differential, but, and the grandparents are essentially trying to make themselves special in the grandchild's eyes so that the grandchild wants to go over and spend time with them. And, and I've used like gift kind of things uh, as examples, but maybe it is that grandpa loves to go fishing and you know, the only person who ever takes the grandkids fishing is grandpa. And so, you know, we love that activity. So it's not, it doesn't have to be, you know, oh, they buy me all the latest PlayStation games. It doesn't have to be a monetary thing. Maybe it's a gift of time or a gift of making me feel special. And they do this because they want me to be around them. Okay, so negative reciprocity describes that kind of behavior. Negative reciprocity solidifies that kind of behavior. It does not solidify any other kind of behavior. We talked about a negative reciprocity situation before um, when we were, when, well, we were having a balanced reciprocity discussion and we were talking about how friendships do not work and won't be sustained unless you have balanced reciprocity. If I was always coming to you, um, you know, needing you to listen to me and give me advice and let me cry on your shoulder and spot me 20 bucks or take me someplace, you know, give me a ride someplace. And then when you were in need just for time or just for a ride someplace or wherever, I was never there for you that relationship is not going to last because that is a negative reciprocity relationship that we're describing there. And if the other party is not getting enough out of what they, or not getting the value out of it that they think that they should, then the relationship is gonna be over. But with the grandmother, grandfather, grandchild role, that, um, that relationship is uh, very different. Uh, it's gonna stay, it's gonna stay put and, and um, you know, grandchildren are gonna come back for more. Okay, there are other relationships too that are categorized by negative reciprocity. Any culture that has a surplus, that produces surplus goods and services in their society for the purpose of trading or selling that surplus, those trade and sales transactions are characterized typically through negative reciprocity. Okay. So let's talk about why. So for instance, uh, Dollar General, there's one right down the street from me. It's extremely convenient, but also it's affordable. There are several different stores right down the street from me. A couple of them are expensive, so I never go there. It's not just the, the proximity to me that makes my economizing behavior decision happen. So Dollar General is a for-profit company. It is not a charitable organization. So even though when I go in there, I feel like I get a really good value for my money, I know, maybe not, maybe it's not the forefront of my mind every time I go in there, but when we go into places like Walmart or Dollar General or Kroger or TJ Maxx or wherever you might like to shop, Burlington or something, wherever you might like to shop, the reason we choose those stores is because we feel that the value we get in return for what we're giving is okay. We wouldn't ever go back to that store if we felt like their prices were too high and and we did, you know, we were giving them more of our money than we wanted to. So I go to Dollar General a lot because I feel like the value for my money is okay. But I know in the back of my mind, Dollar General is a for-profit business. So what they're giving me has a lower real value than the dollars I'm giving them because they're making a profit off that transaction. But I'm willing to let them make the profit because I feel like... I feel like the value they give me is okay. 
So I maintain that relationship with that service provider, that store. I maintain that relationship with that store because I feel like the value that I'm getting is okay. It's a negative reciprocity relationship, but I'm willing to do it. If you buy um, a 2014 Toyota Camry and it has all these bells and whistles and this gas mileage and it's got a sunroof and all this kind of stuff, and you find out that your coworker just bought the same exact model, maybe the paint color's different, but you know the mileage is pretty, pretty much the same and the tires are pretty much the same, moonroof, everything, and you find out that you paid $2,000 more for that car than your coworker did, and your credit was the same and there was no kind of like special price for bad credit or anything, you couldn't find anything that was different, you would probably be mad at the car dealership where you bought yours or the individual where you bought yours or whatever. And if it was a car dealership, you would probably spread the word around to everybody that you work with and all your friends and everything. If you need a car, don't go to that place. Go to this place over here where my friend got a car exactly the same as mine, but that place didn't rip her off and they did rip me off and we would use that word rip me off because we feel like the value maybe we didn't even realize it at that time but now we know that the value we got for our money was not what it should have been or it could have been better and so we're mad that we didn't get that so you know so the next time we need a car we're for sure not going back to that original place we already had that bad experience so the negative reciprocity there because the value wasn't okay with us the, um, you know, the, the exchange and the difference in the value of the exchange wasn't okay with us. We are going to sever that relationship with that, um, with that company and go with a different one the next time. Um, there are other negative reciprocity situations that um, you'll read about in your textbook. For instance, some cultures have a social obligation that when you are exchanging goods and services with other members of your social group, you should be careful to keep and to maintain a balanced reciprocity relationship if you have the same you know, social status and they're in your same cultural group. But that same cultural group sometimes has a requirement that if you are going to make an exchange or a swap of goods and services with an outsider to that, to that culture, somebody who's not from your neck of the woods, not from your social group, the negative, negative reciprocity is required. Your social group would require you to make the exchange with negative reciprocity. In other words, that outsider has to pay you more or exchange more for what they're getting for you than what yours is worth. And if I'm a member of your culture and I find out that you didn't treat an outsider that way, I would be mad because you are supposed to treat outsiders that way. You're only supposed to give your friends and neighbors, your family members, and your immediate cultural group members the consideration of balanced reciprocity, and you're supposed to give outsiders negative reciprocity. So sometimes you'll find trade relationships being mixed, like if you know the people, if you have a kinship relationship with them, if they're part of your cultural group, your religious group, whatever, um, whatever the bond is that holds you together, a lot of times the social custom will require that you have balanced reciprocity, with those folks um, and outsiders, people outside to your immediate social group, you're required to have negative reciprocity. And when I say required, I mean in order to keep me on good terms with you, I want to see that you're treating outsiders like outsiders and insiders like insiders. And that's kind of gonna gonna be, you know, the the baseline for me for you and me to have. Um, happy, healthy, uh, you know, relationships moving forward. So those are the three types of reciprocity. You've got generalized, balanced, and negative. They have different kinds of exchanges associated with them. So they're all economic exchanges, but they have different kind of human relationships associated with them. And they are um, important for you to understand from an anthropology point of view because... Um, 
Because all human relationships can be classified by one of those three types, whether it's personal relationships or subsistence strategy relationships, power relationships, prestige relationships, gender roles within the home, marriage customs, inheritance rights, all of those different kinds of things you can analyze from the lens of one of those three types of reciprocity. Okay, and so reciprocity is also at the core of a more complicated kind of exchange where political power plays a role in the way that people exchange goods and services. We have um, a section in Chapter 6 about leveling mechanisms which are customs and practices that societies have in place to try to bring people from diverse social strata. You know, in social stratification, we have different social classes. And so in societies that have surplus, the possibility is there for some people to rise to this level and other people to be like stuck here. And so that is not very good for maintaining like peace and tranquility over the long haul. And so in some of the, these cases... Um, leveling mechanisms are in place to make sure that the people who are here as in terms of wealth, power, privilege, and prestige, those people are required to, um, or maybe not those people are required, but there's different kinds of leveling mechanisms. Like for instance, maybe a government redistributes wealth or something. There's redistribution, like taxation is a form of redistribution. So if maybe everybody in society is going to be taxed and because you have more money up here, you're going to pay either a higher percentage or even if it's the same percentage, it's a higher amount that's collected because it's a high, it's the same percentage of a higher amount to begin with. And so we redirect that money towards something like housing vouchers or um, supplemental nutrition assistance program or women, infants, and children programs or something like that that, um, you know, give vouchers for food or housing or, um, you know, transportation or different kinds of things like that to help people in need. Um, there's a leveling mechanism in your uh, textbook that you'll read about called a cargo system, or it used to be called in older anthropology books a cargo cult. The word cult um, was used because of the kind of religious, um, the religious overtones of the particular cargo system that's often used as an example. But in Mexico, there are many different, um, there's, a, there's a cargo system that I'll use as an example in Mexico, and there are many different um, religious feast days on the calendar, and there is a leveling mechanism called a cargo cult where when people in society, some are wealthy and some are poor, the wealthy are required to hold this publicly recognized office, not like a mayor or anything, but like a religious official office. And they are required to use their own personal money that they have made in, in their profit dealings to employ, <coughs> excuse me, to employ um, all kinds of townspeople, all kinds of cooks and food producers and, and janitors and decorators and et cetera, et cetera. They're required to use their own money to employ all these people to throw a feast or a celebration or a parade or some kind of event to celebrate certain feast days on the calendar for a certain period of time, let's say a year. So the wealthy person, this wealthy person's term is right now and they, during their term they're required to spend their own money on festivals and public events that all of us are going to partake in and they are paying us to put it on. So it's a way to develop like, um, not develop, but decrease. It's a way to decrease the difference between the wealthy person's position in society and our, our position because they're paying us with their money and they're spending more and more money. And so we're collecting more and more of their money and their money's, you know, it doesn't really, I mean, I'm, I'm misle it's misleading if I say that they're exactly even at the end, but the purpose is to build community and to build um, camaraderie and goodwill feelings toward the wealthy and the poor. And um, so after this year is over, this wealthy person uh, steps out of that office and another wealthy person takes his place. And let's say there's nine wealthy people in that community, then it's going to be nine years until this guy's turn rolls around again. So he can recoup all of his um, wealth 
and uh, reserve a lot of it because he knows that his turn is coming up again and he's going to have to pay us all over again for our expertise and throw the big parties and the festivals that all of us get to partake in and go through that leveling mechanism practice all over again. So that's hard for us to understand in our culture because we don't come from that kind of background. So remember, you have to unlearn what you think is absolute about the knowledge that you have and broaden you know, your mind so we're not ethnocentric about things when we learn about other ways. You know, We don't have um, this kind of habit in our society. We have taxes you know, in, in our society. We like to complain about that. We would complain about the cargo system if it was ours, I'm sure. But... Um, that's the way uh, it's done in general. You can read more details in your textbook. Okay, and so the last little thing that I want to talk to you about um, that was not mentioned in your previous video is that um, we're going to do a flashback really quick to like chapter two, I think it was, when we talked about armchair anthropology and about how in like the 1800s and early 1900s, you had people who were classifying societies from savage, barbarian, and civilized. And um, they were really qualifying, they were using those words which are very, very ethnocentric. Those words were used in very racist, sexist, elitist kind of ways. Um, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, so we can make that observation now and say that was a racist way of doing things or a sexist way of doing things. Um, and they were, you know, they, they were. We were just short-sighted, you know, as far as that goes. So anyway, um... What we do have to recognize as anthropologists, though, is we have to try not to use racist kind of words and terminology or elitist kinds of classifications like savage, barbarian, and civilized. And we have to instead um, recognize that different levels of social complexity exists throughout the world or exist throughout the world. And so we have qualified those levels of social complexity into four different categories, trying to, um, trying to omit, or what's the word I'm looking for, trying to stay away from ethnocentric kind of judgmental words that could be interpreted or could symbolize racist, sexist, elitist, Western culture-centered kind of biases because we don't want to do that in anthropology, right? So there are four levels of social complexity. The first level that we recognize is called a band, B-A-N-D. And a band, when you think of a band, think of um, foragers. I mean, you can have um, sedentary populations that are bands, but bands, I, I, the reason I tell you to think of foragers is because it's usually a very small group of people, maybe 25 to 40 people, and all of those people are related to each other by blood or by marriage. All of them are related to each other. Okay, and so that works for... That works so that it's a very loose kind of political or authority system. You're all related to each other. So the lead person or people are usually the elders in the group. Um, the elder male, if it's a patriarchal political structure. The eldest female or females, if it's a matriarchal social structure. So anyway, a band has everybody related to each other. And um, so they don't have to have like a system of laws or a system of elected officials or anything like this. You just kind of inherit um, power from your age and your gender in the society, depending upon which gender is favored or, or not. Okay. And so um, bands sometimes get really too large to support themselves um, or to stay one cohesive group. And so a decision would be made to break one band up into like two bands and then maybe those two bands get too large. You know, if there's three brothers in this band and they have three wives each and each wife has ten kids or something, you know, that's too too large. And so you're probably going to break that up into more bands and you go off on your own. And so after that happens for a few generations, you've got many bands that have a common ancestor between them. Maybe we don't remember who the common ancestor is, but all of us recognize loosely that we all came from an original ancestor and we look to each other's groups for counsel, for um, economic cooperation a little bit, for... Um, for wives, for other kinds of um, exchanges that happen among the groups. 
And that is our second, that describes our second social complexity called a tribe. A tribe is really a collection of bands, and the bands have this general understanding that they have a common ancestor, but it's too long ago in the past for us to really remember who specifically was our first common ancestor. We just know that there was a common ancestor at one point. And the leader of a tribe would be the most uh, powerful bands, um, most senior or most powerful person, whether it's male or female, depending upon the patriarchy or the matriarchy social structure, which we'll talk about much more in um, the chapter after spring break. Okay. Um, all right. And then after tribe, we have something called a chiefdom. So a chiefdom, you can think of it as a collection of tribes. That's really not um, going to going to mesh with the definition in the textbook. What a chiefdom is, is think of like small villages or small um, little cities in a certain region. And there's one like central or more populated place where the central authority and guidance comes from. And so that's the chiefdom. The chiefdom would be that entire region where there are little villages littered around, but there's kind of like a central hub where there's a larger population and the most powerful people who govern and rule, um, ha you know, make it their uh, make it their hub where they stay. Okay, so that's a chiefdom. And um, chiefdoms, the power is usually, you know, maybe inherited from bloodline or from, you know, his, the historical significance of um, the different people in the area. Um, sometimes people can take over uh, control based on warfare or something like that. But, um, and there might be laws, uh, there, there are going to be laws and social customs that govern your behavior, but there's not going to be, um, you know, a whole lot of laws and law enforcement and all that to, to make people follow the social customs. You've got small enough uh, villages in the chiefdom to where the kind of control that a tribe would have with um, and authority that a tribe would have over its people is kind of the way the village is organized. <coughs> and they all automatically like look to the chiefdom because of the power that, that comes from, or the center of the chiefdom because of the power that comes uh, from there. Okay. So um, the fourth political structure, the one that um, the ethnocentric armchair anthropologist called civilized, um, the fourth one is called a state. Now, this is a general term that you should not immediately think, oh, they're talking about the states like we have states in the United States. No. States in the United States do fit under this category. However, an entire country fits under this category also. A state is simply a word that refers to a collection of people. It's way too large. Not everybody's related to each other. There's no understanding of a common ancestor. Usually the household and your, your um, immediate family and your extended family, usually those are the only kinds of kinship connections that people are aware of. And law and order comes from a centralized place that has enforcement lawmaking, courts, that kind of thing. So um, you can have a parliament or a congress or a president or a monarch or a dictator or any of these things, but there are laws, there's military, there's police forces, there's all these kinds of things to keep law and order, so to speak. And there's regulations and, and all sorts of really complex um social and cultural behaviors that govern daily exchanges between people. And so, and the purpose it supposedly is to make sure that everybody has, you know, an equal playing field or has the same kind of expectation for interaction um, between each other. Um, but you also see a great deal of social stratification, great big gaps between one social class and the next in social stratification. So that complicates things. You know, the laws aren't necessarily um, applied equally to somebody in this position as they are somebody in this position. And so it, it complicates things and it can affect social stratification. But a state is for a huge population density of people that and you have laws that govern them and um, 
not everybody has the same idea of like kinship commonality as definitely as you would in a band and definitely as you would in a tribe, but even in a chiefdom with which you can think of sort of as a collection of tribes that look to one centralized place. Um, even in that chiefdom, there's sort of like a cultural connectedness of the different tribes that is an incentive for playing nice with each other in a state, you don't have that cultural connectedness necessarily. You've got laws that connect you. And um, we gotta make sure that we enforce those laws and that you follow those laws. And there's larger population densities. So um, I'm mentioning all these social complexity categories because you will need to um, have that information handy when you're looking at all the scenarios on project three so that you can be successful answering those um, questions. And also because in the kinship chapter, we're going to start with some information about um, why anthropologists, when we do ethnography, like Napoleon Chagnon did that ethnography that y'all read um, the case study from, why are we so focused on kinship and genealogies like he was? Um, bands, tribes, and even chiefdoms, and to a certain extent, the legal aspect of states also makes kinship a legal thing in a state organization. Um, the person who is the father or the person who is the mother has a legal obligation to a child in a state organization. Um, other kinds of social complexities don't necessarily have a legal standing for individuals. So if someone didn't have parents, there is no legal adoption. There is another social safety net to, you know, to take that ch child into a household where it can be cared for. So there are a whole lot of things about kin, kinship, and who we think our kin, you know, our kin folk are. There's a whole bunch of things in this next unit that we're about to start that you're going to have to unlearn about that. Even the word father that I just used in this video. Um, the word father in our culture usually includes two meanings, really. We're talking about the individual who contributed the biological matter to create us but also the individual who is, has a social connection with us and, you know, takes us to the playground and teaches us how to fish and gives us 20 bucks for gas and checks our homework for us and all that socially kind of responsible stuff for us. We usually put those two meanings toward the same person when we say father. Other cultures break that apart and have two different words for that. So other cultures don't just use the word dad or father. They have two different ones. You might have one that refers to the person who contributed the biological material to conceive you, but you also have the person who helps you with your homework and takes you to soccer practice and does whatever else dad is supposed to do. And other cultures um, distinguish those people into two different, they're not the same person. They're two different people or Eight different people but I won't um, give you any more than that that'll just be a teaser for the next unit so make sure that you have these videos handy rerun them for yourself to make sure that your notes are thorough listen to them in your car when you're on your commute so that you have some of the information in mind so that you can do really really well on project three because I expect great things from all of you and I will see you back here um, after spring break bye